Hello, welcome to the Oral History of Criminology Project. We are here today in Doha, Qatar at the 13th United Nations Crime Congress in 2015. My name is Rosemary Barbare, and today I'm going to be interviewing Margaret Shaw from Canada about her life and distinguished career in criminology and criminal justice. Margaret, I've been pleased to know you, I think, for a considerable amount of time, and I call you a friend. I'm very happy to be interviewing you today. I'm wondering if you could tell us how you became involved in criminology. Um, I would love to. It could take some time. Um, one of the issues is that I'm also from England. I'm from Britain. So it's interesting to be described as from Canada, but that, that works too. Um, I became interested in criminology when I was a student. I went to a very good university, Leeds, where there was a fantastic sociology department full of very um, ambitious new professors and some old ones. Um, and I decided to take a course in criminology and the teacher was someone called Norman Jepson who was professor of sociology but also taught uh, prison officers at the local prisons in Bradford and as part of the the course he made us obviously read Goffman's Asylums and I had spent two summers before and during my first year at university working in a mental hospital and so the Goffman's description of, of asylums was for me very very evident very clear and the links with prison was absolutely fascinating. And I think it was because, because of Norman Jepson and also because of just the interest and in the kind of topics that you deal with in, in criminology at that time, certainly, I just became hooked. Hmm. Would you say he was your first mentor? And that the, these were the major ideas that impacted you then, Goffman, is where you started. I think so. I mean, I don't know that Norman Jepson was particularly aware that he was a mentor to me. I mean, I, we didn't have close relationships as an undergraduate mm -hmm. with, with, with our professors, mm -hmm. but I remember him as an extraordinarily open and I think someone who cared very deeply about social justice issues, and for me that's what criminology is about. Okay, and then you went on to pursue postgraduate work? Not at that time. In those days, if you were a male, you might possibly apply for some money to do postgraduate work, but certainly in Britain um, at that time in the 60s, it wasn't necessary. Um, and many of the um, people who wanted to work in this field would go into public service mm -hmm. if they did. I mean, mm -hmm. not many people actually saw that there was something they could do in that field. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, I applied to the civil service and to the home office, which had a research unit at that point. Um, and that's where I began working fully as a, as a criminologist. Can you explain to the international audience what the home office is? The home office is in other countries, the Ministry of Interior. Um, it was responsible for everything from Northern Ireland, cleaning statues, the prison system, um, milk um, in, in Jersey and the Channel Islands. I mean, in other words, an enormous hodgepodge array, but it had very clearly responsibility for criminal justice and criminal justice legislation, mm -hmm. as well as the prison and probation service. So it had very close um, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And you were there for 22 years, right? 22 or 23, okay. yeah. And um, you were given a wide variety of assignments. Did, did you have any say in what assignments you were given? No, it was, you would be asked if you were interested in doing something, but basically this is, when I started it was um, working on uh, a cohort of uh, children born in a particular week um, in the 1940s who had been through the criminal justice system as juveniles. And so they had picked out all of this cohort and we began to use that to look at magistrates' sentencing patterns in London, so the, the juvenile court system in, in London. Um, I mean, one of the, the things about working in the research unit throughout the time I was there, that you had access to amazing data sets and you had permission 
something you don't have in a university. Um, and quite often the kinds of things you would do would be quite grand, quite large in scale. So that was a, a wonderful kind of opportunity. Mm -hmm. The second project, and the one I think where I really began to learn, because this was a process of learning how to be a researcher and mm -hmm. how to do analysis, how to understand what you're doing, always with other members of the, the research unit who would be more senior and have a different kind of view about what, what the younger staff should do. Mm -hmm. But for me, the second major task was um, to be involved in a random control trial in three prisons in the middle of England. And this was an experiment in the development of prison social work, which had not been used. So the notion was to put probation officers into prisons and for them to link probationers up, or the, the prisoners up with uh, aftercare officers, as they were called, but they were also probation officers. They would be parole officers mm -hmm. here. It was something that only, uh, there was no social workers in prisons before that period of time. And so the Home Office, I think, had some very um, forward-looking ideas mm -hmm. for a number of years. It was very inventive and, and very concerned about criminal justice. There were problems also, but a lot of the work that we did was to look at things which would improve the condition of the uh, of, of prisoners of court systems, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Was that randomized trial early for its day then? I don't know that it was early, um, but it was successful. Um, and as a result of the success, they decided to replicate it. And the replication didn't work. Um, and this for me was the beginning of a process of understanding Something about how policy is made, which is also, for me, you know, one of the, the, the things that motivates what I do. I'm interested in how policy change gets made mm -hmm. and how you can help that process along. Mm -hmm. But because the, the project was uh, replicated by somebody else in a very different prison setting, mm -hmm. you could question whether it was actually a replication or a different version of it. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was, in a sense, um, unusual for something like the Home Office to have done random controlled trial. Hmm. Okay. And at some point you went on to get your PhD? That was much later, yeah. But before you crossed the Atlantic? Before I crossed the Atlantic, yeah. So before then, I was also involved in another major project, which was um, a self-report defending study a self-report study with juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, again, a very enlightened project, one in which um, my former colleague at the Home Office, Ron Clark, was involved. Um, and under Ron's direction, we developed a survey um, across British Isles, um, interviewing both males and females and parents about parental supervision. It mm -hmm. was a test of Travis Hirsch's notions of social control. Mm -hmm. So this was a wonderful, again, wonderful opportunity to be able to sort of test out some ideas. And what was very exciting in a way, and we didn't, I mean, I don't think I was quite aware, maybe Ron was as well, but I don't think he was. Um, this was the first time we had comparative gender mm -hmm. information. And I remember going to um, a meeting in The Hague um, on self-report delinquency, an international meeting, um, after the study was finished, mm -hmm. about 1986 or 7. And ours was the only study that included girls. And I remember in the discussions explaining to people why it was valuable to have girls, because you were able to look at boys in a very different light. Mm -hmm and you were ab able to compare their, the two lives, the way their parents thought about them, the way they thought about themselves, the way they integrated what they did with their time. For me, it was a very clear demonstration of the importance of including gender in, mm -hmm. in any piece of work. Mm -hmm. Was that the first major piece of work you did that really included or addressed gender? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before that, it was studies of men in prison. And in the Home Office, I had, um, a very lovely colleague, Nancy Goodman, who was interested in girls, and she did studies in the women's prison. Mm -hmm. 
system, but she got very little attention in, in a sense and, and little money was attached to it. Mm. And it, it, it played quite a small role. Mm. Most of the attention was on male prisoners, on offenders going through court systems of these kinds of, of, of issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. And after that they had you work on many other projects, I think. Um, in the Home Office, yes, that, and then I, that was where I began uh, working on crime prevention. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of um, emphasis on situational prevention, quite obviously because Ronald Clark was there at the Home Office mm -hmm. and was developing his projects and his ideas on situational prevention. A lot of other people were working on you know, the use of helmets and you know, other kinds of situational prevention mm -hmm. projects. Um, and we had uh, a conference at Cambridge um, on community responses to crime prevention mm -hmm. um, or community crime prevention. Um, I think we actually at the time called it uh, crime reduction mm -hmm. rather than crime prevention. And it was an international conference, um, involved many Americans coming over. It was a, a very interesting one. We produced a book out of that conference. But again, that was one of the first times I began to begin to critique a lot of what we were looking at in terms mm -hmm. of social, uh, in terms of situational prevention. Mm -hmm. And I, as a sociologist by training, um, Ron, as you know, was a psychologist by training. As a sociologist, I, I had a different sense of mm -hmm. what, what the issues were. Um, so it, it, again, it was interesting to look at that process and some of this was happening without really realizing it as you you work mm -hmm. and as you begin to produce and write things and then afterwards you you realize how significant some of these these sort of ideas were mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, was most of your work then focused on crime prevention or youth and gender is, is that how you would define yourself has that carried out through when did you become sort of international in scope um, okay, I'll do that one second, but in terms of most of my work on crime prevention, no, no, it's not true. I think most of my work has been on prisons. Well, at least half of the work I've done has been mm -hmm. on prisons. So I moved to Canada in 1986 um, and began working there on um, a major survey of the entire federal population of women prisoners, mm -hmm. um, which in Canada was quite small at the time because not many women are federally sentenced because in order to be a federal prisoner you have to have a sentence of over two years. So the majority of women are in mm -hmm. provincial prison. So I was um, involved in, in undertaking a survey for a task force on federally sentenced women. And again it was an opportunity to um, look at an extremely interesting sort of area uh, and this continued for around 12 years looking at women offenders, women and the justice system, um, another survey on women in the in Ontario prison system, um, a study of the evaluation of um, feminist therapy mm -hmm. with women offenders, extremely interesting project, which got me interested in issues of evaluation a lot, and again, how policy gets made. So um, there's been all of these phases mm -hmm. mixing in mm -hmm. together. Um, and it, the work was international the moment I, I moved to Canada, I think, because when you move, you become very aware of the differences in your culture and your, in your justice system, mm -hmm. even, even the simplest things like that. And you, you are much more attuned to what is going on in, in these kinds of systems. Mm -hmm. So I think you become more, more critical. International criminologists are sometimes criticized for doing a bit of everything, um, yet those that I know consider that a strength. What do you think? I've always thought it's a, a strength because I, I could, from moving from one country to another, mm -hmm. I could compare in a way that I wouldn't have been able to before and understand things in a slightly different way. So I think it's an enormous strength to have a little knowledge we can never, you know, you can't grow up in two different places. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an enormous strength to be able to look at what is happening in other places and to examine the way people understand. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, a lot of what I've 
I've done has been to try to to look at the way people experience things themselves. So that's another element of what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Interviewing prisoners, um, examining the way people themselves describe the issues which they're confronted with. I think it makes uh, um, the, the whole issue of, of participation and in, in projects, these kinds of things. I think these are, are, are very important. Can you talk a little bit about your work at ICPC? Yes, which is what you asked me when I became really international. Um, I joined ICPC um, after a spell of, of teaching and, mm -hmm. and doing a lot of research. Mm -hmm. and can you tell us what it stands for? It's the International Center for the Prevention of Crime, um, set up in 1994 in Montreal with a lot of member com countries, um, funded by member countries and set up by Canada, France um, and Quebec initially, but others, other countries and other organizations mm -hmm. are involved. And the role of ICPC is specifically, obviously, to look at crime prevention and to promote crime prevention and what I would call community safety, because mm -hmm. that's more than just preventing crime. It's about social well-being, quality of life, um, and a much broader concept. Um, so for me, I, I moved from uh, working within and doing research within a policy context, absolutely, mm. in the Home Office, to working as a professor and teaching and doing independent research, but again for government, a lot of it for the government mm -hmm. of Canada in terms of women prisons. Um, and then I moved again and shifted into an international NGO. So it's, in a way, part of my motivation was to move back to the, 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 the things you can do as a researcher uh, to influence what's happening. Teaching you can do to some extent. You can hope to influence mm -hmm. people, and you can you can publish things. Mm -hmm. But certainly, the model is quite different when you're doing a, a, a research piece for someone as a contract, and right. you hand it over that to them. You have no opportunity to discuss the implications of what's involved or mm -hmm. to influence policy a little mm -hmm. more, which was possible at the time that I was at the Home Office. So moving into the international fields, uh, into an NGO, was again an opportunity to look at what was happening, at what some of the issues were, to look for as the role of ICPC as mm. good practices, innovative practices, to look for both the, the difficulties and the pessimistic aspects of mm. what's happening in different countries, but to try to bring people together to show them maybe there is a different way which would be more positive and mm -hmm. might, if it's well adapted or fits into your cultural backgrounds mm -hmm. and your, your circumstances, mm -hmm. could be valuable for you too. Best practice is a word that's bandied around a lot. What does it mean to you in the context of the work that you've done? I, I tend not to use the word best practice because it implies it's best. Um, I think I prefer something like innovative practices or good practices. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, we spent a lot of time at ICPC trying to define what we meant by this, because it is obviously mm -hmm. controversial. Um, but it, it, for me, it means that it's a project which is well thought through, has got a very logical assessment of what it's trying to do mm -hmm. in terms of what the problems are. So there's a good analysis of what the problems are. Mm -hmm. It has produced some ostensibly logical um, explanation of how it might try to improve things, mm -hmm. um, that it's well directed, well implemented, reasonably financed um, and supported, and that it doesn't just end after you know, six months, mm -hmm. that it's something that could be sustained and extended beyond. So in selecting examples for other people to look at in an area like youth at risk, which mm -hmm. is a, a large area of the work I've done with ICPC. Mm -hmm. um, we would be looking for projects which have been around for a little bit of time, but seem to fit those criteria of being carefully thought through, well implemented, with some evaluation, and are rational. It's not just 
a good idea that you hand something out at the end of the week to mm -hmm. somebody. It's something much more constructive than that. Murray, you've won a number of awards recently for your work. International Awards, the Division on Women in Crimes Award for Practice. Um, what do you see as your most significant contribution so far in your career to criminology? Well, um, I have to say the awards were wonderful. I mean, I, they were totally unexpected because I'm someone who slipped through I've sort of been a sort of academic. I've been a policy researcher. I work in an NGO. It's not the normal sort of path where mm -hmm. you become extremely well known. Mm -hmm. um, I published an enormous amount of material, but most of it is what we call grey literature. It's not peer reviewed mm -hmm. and it's not hardcover books that cost a lot of money. So much of my work doesn't necessarily, you know, isn't necessarily seen. But I, I suppose I hope that what I've contributed is um, all around the theme of social justice, of change, of trying to affect change in, in justice systems and in other aspects which affect the, the lives of, of people involved in the system. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also about the importance of gender because for me this has become very very um, sort of fundamental. Uh, there was a major study that um, I did with a colleague from the University of Toronto on risk assessment in Canada following the surveys that we that I completed on, on federally sentenced women and that study was demonstrating the inadequacies from my point of view of applying um, a very formal and fixed um, assessment system on people that it was not designed for. And so in this case it was a risk assessment system which was I think developed in the States on young male offenders which was then being developed in Canada to use in the male prisons mm -hmm. and it was assumed that women could automatically be assessed in the same way. It was also assumed that it would be suitable to use to assess Aboriginal women mm. and Aboriginal men. Um, and so I had seen some of this when I was doing the survey that some of the, the impacts of these kinds of approaches where there is a very clear and fixed uh, and theoretically very sort of coherent mm -hmm. approach which is used that it doesn't seem to work. And one illustration is that in the, the risk assessment that was um, being applied at the time, uh, women were asked whether they ever had visions, and this was, you know, one of, the, there were many other things. Do you ever, le have you ever left a child under the age of three alone or 10 under the, mm -hmm. I don't remember what the, the age was. If you are an Aboriginal woman, then visions are part of the process of being part of your life, of being an Aboriginal woman, so that the, the language itself was not appropriate. And the notion that women, certainly the women who were federally sentenced in Canada, who come f usually or quite often from extremely difficult circumstances, and something like 25% uh, of them are Aboriginal background mm -hmm. and have had very difficult lives, those women will have left children alone. I've left my children alone. Most mothers have left their children alone. These are questions which I don't think a woman would have uh, written. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a woman, but I, I you know, in my, in my terms, mm -hmm. these are not, this was not taking account of gender and, and other issues, so the intersection of all of these factors. Mm -hmm. So that risk assessment uh, study was, I think, uh, you know, another very um, interesting project that I was able to do with mm -hmm. Kelly Hannah Moffat. Um, How has your work been received? and the debate and criticism so common in criminology and law, and so common also as your work is read by policymakers. Do you have a sense of how your work has been received? Maybe some studies received differently than others, things that have impacted the field that maybe you wouldn't have thought would achieve that? It's, um, it's, a, it's a big question to, to know. I mean, I'm not really sure. I mean, you can say, certainly when you work in a policy, in, in policy uh, research in, in, a, in a government mm -hmm. department, then usually people are happy with what you do. 
because in a sense what you're doing is putting together for them a whole set of questions that they didn't think about mm -hmm. or had not put together in those kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And perhaps by, I don't know, personality, but also um, other reasons, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, it's, I suppose it's partly my, my personality, but also the way I prefer to, to work. I, I tend not to be confrontational in what I do and in how I write, but I am usually quite critical in what I do. So in a sense, I see myself as always being critical and questioning what is accepted, mm -hmm. um, and then trying to look at the complexities. So I think that you know a lot of what criminology for me is about is that all of the problems we deal with, whether it's evaluating a crime prevention program, mm -hmm. a community crime prevention program, evaluating a program for youth at risk in South Africa or in, in, in Kenya, or any of these kinds of things, or evaluating programs that you set up in prisons, there's much more complexity involved in in human behavior and human life and in prison uh, in prison environments mm -hmm. than than we give credit to so i think that i think that all um research is messy i mean the random control mm -hmm. trial that, that we undertook in in britain it was very messy because you can't control everybody, mm -hmm. and you can't control what happens outside, but you actually get something out of that. In the same way, the evaluation field, with the notion that you have um, you know, the gold standard of evaluation, is very good for situational crime prevention. It's not good for uh, evaluating, I mean, it doesn't, you cannot use the random controlled trial mm -hmm. so easily Mm -hmm. to evaluate community projects where you're intervening in six or seven or eight different types of ways. It's a much more complex process. Mm -hmm. Change is going to take longer. And usually projects don't have that follow-up time and the, and the amount of uh, evaluation and money attached to them mm -hmm. that you would need. So that doesn't answer your question of how, how it's been affected. Um, I think it's been helpful in some cases. I've, I've done various pieces of work for the Canadian government mm -hmm. on children under the age of criminal responsibility and restorative justice mm -hmm. processes and other things, which um, I think have been useful contributions in terms of looking at literature, mm -hmm. looking at the, the problems and suggestions mm -hmm. way forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, in your international work, and as you moved from national to international, are there things that you learned about how to write for an international audience and how to cover international issues that might be of use to people watching? I think for me, I mean, this is partly being a, a sociologist and a, a criminologist, that context um, is incredibly important. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing for me in terms of working internationally is that you cannot take some idea that you've developed in one city or one country mm -hmm. and just assume that it will work somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and so in writing, I've tried very hard always to talk about the importance of adapting or um, modifying ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing is that I realized after the 15 or so years that I was working with ICPC that I learned far more from the countries that I went to than I d did the other way. Mm -hmm. In other words, that it was going to a, a different place mm -hmm. um, that you understand and learn a great deal more than you thought you knew. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, informs, it's reflexive, it goes base, both ways. Mm -hmm. And I think the notion that researchers are at the top and tell people what to do is, it, it was very prevalent in um, 60s, 70s, and the 80s. It's been very prev prevalent quite recently, mm -hmm. the notion that the researchers know the answers and they have to train other people in order to understand what they need to do. For me, I, I think a more, if you like, humble approach um, needs to be um, 
incorporated by researchers, which means that you're going to learn a lot more from other people, mm -hmm. which will help both of you understand mm. more the complexities of the problems mm -hmm. and the need for a wider variety of approaches to how you understand it, how you evaluate mm -hmm. it, your kind of theoretical frameworks, you're using all of those things. Right. Um, as a non-traditional scholar, as you define yourself, have you perhaps had different experiences or where have you been happiest? You've worked for government, you've worked as an independent consultant, what you're doing now, you've worked for an NGO, you've worked at a university, you've had a wide exposure to settings that most people in the audience perhaps have not had. How do these settings differ in terms of framing your research, controlling what you'd really like to research as opposed to what needs to be done, what you're told to do? Where have you found things most satisfying professionally for you? That's very difficult because um, I like, I think I've enjoyed all of the settings that I've been involved in. Um, I don't think I was ever in a situation where I was told what to do, which is interesting because many perceptions of certainly of government research is that you are told what you should mm -hmm. do. And that, that very rarely happened in the work that I was doing. It was at a period, I think, when research was valued and the importance of research for policy making mm -hmm. was increased, increase, people were increasingly aware of it. Mm -hmm. That may not be the case in some countries more recently. Um, they are very different settings. I think that when I was teaching, I found it, um, I enjoyed teaching, I find it very hard um, because I wanted to put a lot of energy in, into the teaching mm -hmm. and a lot of understanding and learning. Um, and I really am happiest when I can sit down with a new project and begin to, if you like, problematize mm -hmm. what the issues are and try to draw on, I mean, I always work very widely. I mean, I, I, I try and read as widely as I can and then understand what, what the, is, the issues are. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, to be an end to work independently is, is, is nice. You can go home when you want, or you are at home. But it's, um, you are to at some extent dependent upon somebody wanting something done. Mm -hmm. And that's in a way less interesting than being in a setting where you can perhaps influence policy making more. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the disadvantages of being more independent. Mm -hmm. In a university setting, you can, you can still write a lot but mm -hmm. you can't necessarily influence policymakers so much. Right. Do you have any advice for younger scholars, particularly those wondering if their PhD has to be in academia or whether they can do other things? I, th I mean, I think this is a really interesting issue because, you know, from time to time, I've been in situations where people have assumed that I'm not an academic because I am not within an academic department. Um, and the assumption is that you can only be a good s scholar. Mm -hmm. You can only be a good researcher if you spend your life in a university setting. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the opposite. I think that you can be a good researcher and a good academic if you have a lot of exposure to what's happening outside and to systems mm -hmm in a way that you don't necessarily get from an mm -hmm. academic setting. So for me to be able to spend three years interviewing men in prison, um, in different prisons under as part of a random control mm -hmm. trial, this was the most amazing kind of learning experience in terms of, of research. Um, very different from, you know, mm -hmm. having to apply for permission and interview right. 20 prisoners. I mean, that's, that's just one example, but, mm -hmm. but the opportunity to be given the opportunity to, to interview all women, federally sentenced women in prison. I didn't do the interviewing, I was running the project, mm -hmm. but to recruit women who would interview the women. And so we were able to recruit ab Aboriginal women who spoke the languages of the women in those prisons, mm -hmm. Francophone women, obviously, for women in Quebec or outside in, on, in Franco-Ontarians, mm -hmm. for example, in other parts of Canada. In Ontario, um, the ab ability to to 
to develop that kind of project mm -hmm. was was quite extraordinary. So it was a wonderful opportunity at a time when Canada was extremely concerned to to think completely anew how they dealt with women offenders mm -hmm. and women prisoners. And out of that came a report called Creating Choices, which was um, really the leader in the world at that time, mm. uh, 1990, that it was, was published. And as a result of that report, instead of a 19th century prison in Kingston, which housed the, the federally sentenced women for the most part, and it was, you know, the, 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 it was the real panopticon. Mm -hmm. um, they built new prisons with places for women to live with their kids, with nurseries attached, separate houses. They did their own housework and cleaned their houses and cooked. So it, it was an entirely different lifestyle. The mm -hmm. fact that that has not worked is to do with the the nature of the prison, mm -hmm. and we know a lot about the nature of the prison mm -hmm. to continually turning on itself, but it, it was a, an extraordinarily optimistic period of time and the opportunity to do that wouldn't necessarily have come if I had been in an academic setting. Right. So would you, what, what advice would you give younger scholars? I think that, uh, I, I would say that it's extremely important to, to, to work in different settings to do some work in in government settings if necessary. I mean, it doesn't have to be government, could be other kinds of settings. But uh, to work um, internationally if you can. There are internships in various places um, that people can, can do. Um, to work for organizations on the ground elsewhere. But to, um, and, and to, to get a much broader experience of what the issues are mm -hmm. because when you come back to your own country if you stay there you have a very different understanding of, of, of what things are. How would you characterize the current state of the field? Do you think there are some things that need to be changed, some questions that the field ought to be turning its attention to from from where you sit? I, I find that you know the the presidential lecture every every year is, is always um, really interesting for me. I mean, that's, it's almost like an, a novel, you know, you, you, you get it and, and, and have a look, and every now and then there's one that, that I find extraordinary. Um, there was, um, well, for me, you know, really sets off a lot of issues, and, one, uh, and a lot of my concerns have been around the issue of evaluation. And Todd Clear, a few years ago, gave a, a lecture which I have used a lot in trying to sort of think about 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 those issues. Um, to some extent, I mean, I think that the, it has felt like, you know, the, the division of women and crime is, is quite small over there in the corner and um, the awful lot of, of, of work has been, uh, you know, gendered in the sense that it's, it's mostly um, men who are involved in working in, in criminology and this has influenced so much of what we've done. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have been able to make enormous strides in terms of um, looking at gender and in terms of feminist analysis. And I hope that this continues and becomes quite normal for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that um, we're in a wonderful setting to be able to listen to the call for prayers. Yeah. Um, I hope there's now more flexibility in relation to evaluation. Mm -hmm. The notion that you can have real world evaluation, that you can look at outcomes other than just crime, that you mm -hmm. can incorporate other elements. The notion that there should be some sort of flexibility mm -hmm. in the way we understand mm -hmm. outcomes. So I think those are very important and I would like, I would like um, the notion of, 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 of gender to become much more widely understood mm -hmm. and accepted in, okay. in people's work. And I would like people to look outside their own country and not just assume that the, the interesting problems mm -hmm. are just the ones that you have in front of you mm -hmm. or the one that's convenient to get for your research mm -hmm. population. Um, would you have done anything differently if you were beginning your career again? 
what I might have done if I'd known about it would have been to go off to UNODC in Vienna, mm -hmm. perhaps, at the beginning, yeah. and had a, an internship there. I didn't know about those things then. Mm -hmm. it, maybe they, they didn't exist, I don't mm -hmm. know. I think for me that would have been um, a very interesting experience. Do you mean start your international perspective earlier in yeah. your career? Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, how do you think you'll be remembered? <laughs> As a pluralist, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> As someone who has been uh, difficult about risk assessment and uh, concerned about women offenders, um, I've done quite a bit on on youth violence um, and done some work with UN Habitat mm -hmm. on youth violence. I won't be remembered for something like that, but for me that's another area of work which I care a lot about mm -hmm. um, in terms of bringing other people's attention to issues. Um, I suppose really it's, you know, what, what motivates me, as I said before, is in terms of social justice mm -hmm. um, and to be always open and and to ask questions about what the issues are. Um, I don't know, it's, it's uh, difficult to know other than somebody <laughs> who worked in the Home Office or was somebody else's professor or worked as an NGO. It's, I don't know, because a lot of what you write doesn't get read okay. for many people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fair enough. Is there anything perhaps you'd like to add that we haven't covered? It's difficult to uh, difficult to think about what else <laughs> we should have covered. Um, I think I've enjoyed a lot working um, at the international level, but that but that for me is a kind of luxury to be able to do that to work with UNODC, with UN Habitat, with UN Women. So those are some of the things I've done more recently, and that for mm -hmm. me is a kind of luxury that comes with with having worked your way through a whole set of, of areas of mm -hmm. work. I occasionally think that I'll go back to prisons again because I spent such a long time mm -hmm. working on prison issues, but um, we'll see. All right. Thank you very much for the Thank interview, you, Margaret. Margaret.